Welcome to the X's and Argos film session for week three, following the Argos victory over the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So before we get into our film session today, I just wanted to take a second to share part of an email that we received this morning, which made me really happy because it's what this entire segment is all about. I'm going to read part of this for you. This is from an Argos season ticket holder. He wrote, I've been going to Argos games for over 30 years, and on Saturday, for the first time, I found myself watching the offensive line instead of the quarterback. It was incredible. It was like when the Wizard of Oz changes from black and white to color. And I have your videos to thank for it. Yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm hoping for. Even if it's just this one guy, that's okay. I'm not here to tell you how to watch and how to enjoy football. I, that's, that's not my responsibility. If you love watching football the way you love watching football, do it. Awesome. That's great. You can, if you just do nothing but focus on the ball, watch the way that TV sort of presents it to you, it's still the greatest game in the world. There's, there's no question in my mind about that. However, if you are looking for something slightly more, if you want to try, and it's really hard to do this on TV, but when you're live there at the game, whether you're going to, to Hamilton for the, for the Labor Day Classic or the next time the Argos are playing at BMO, and you go down to the field to watch the game, that's where you really have a cool opportunity to see the game in what I think is a, a more interesting way. And you don't have to watch the same player every time. You don't have to just watch the offensive line. Choose a matchup. Say, well, there's there's DeVaris Daniels, and he's matched up against their best corner. Let's take a look at this battle. And that's all you watch on that one play. Just watch that battle. See who wins it. Find another one. Let's say, well, I'm going to watch Jamal Campbell for this whole series and see how that looks. I'm going to watch the, the defensive secondary. Let's see how Shaq Richardson communicates with Kresden Butler and with Jeff Richards. Let's watch that, this series. And I promise you, the more you start doing that, the more exciting, the more interesting the game becomes. And that's where you really start to learn a little bit about the game. So if these videos prompt you to do some of that, I'm absolutely thrilled. If you're just watching them because it's something to do on a weekday morning, that's fine too. I have no problem with that. Again, I'm not here to tell you how to watch football. I'm just happy you're watching it. All right, let's get to our film session here. Today, we're going to look at DJ Foster's performance. It was his first CFL game, and Foster had 10 carries for 101 yards and a touchdown, rushing for over 10 yards a carry. This is an outstanding game, but it was the result of three things. Number one, John White. Number two, play design. And that's where we're incorporating the creativity and intelligence of our play callers and Coach Dinwiddie and Coach Jackson. And also Foster's ability as an outstanding running back, because there's no question that DJ Foster is an outstanding running back. And we obviously have to give him some credit too. And I know what you're saying, but Ben, what about the offensive line? Didn't you tell us that the offensive line's always responsible when a skill player has a great game? Yes, them too. We're not really going to focus on them today. I will bring them up in one play. But as we've discussed before, anytime a QB, receiver, running back does something excellent, the line should get at least half the credit. And there's no exception here. But that's not really going to be the focus of our film session today. So in week two, John White scorched the Blue Bombers. He had over 100 yards on the ground, averaging over nine yards a carry. Winnipeg came into this week determined to shut him down, no matter what. When he was on the field, it was like a zombie apocalypse movie. Nothing else mattered. It was like the Blue Bombers couldn't see anybody else but him. And of course, that helped every other Toronto Argonaut. Play fakes to White went for huge gains all day. And DJ Foster benefited as well. When he was in the backfield, the Winnipeg defense wasn't on red alert the way that they were when White was in the backfield. And they weren't run blitzing nearly as much either. Where it really presents itself is in the missed tackles. Nobody missed a tackle on John White, but there were missed tackles on almost everybody else. All right, here's Foster. It's second and short. Everyone knows it's a running play. What happened to the tackling? There's no way they would have let White convert this 
on Saturday. Last week, sure. Seven different guys make contact with Foster on this play before he goes down. Eight, if you count Alexander trying to strip the ball at the end here. Think about that. Middle run, no misdirection, no RPO, but he didn't have a target on his back like White did. They had never even heard of him, and that worked to his advantage. He's not going to get the same treatment next game, and so now there's an opportunity for White to respond next week. That's the beauty of having two great running backs like this. You got to give some credit to Coach Dinwiddie and Coach Jackson as well. They knew that Winnipeg had been watching film of John White embarrassing them all week long. So they used this to their advantage in, in putting him out there with Foster sometimes. So in this scenario, we've got White lined up in the backfield. Foster's the inside man in, in quads here. So we've got a halfback run blitz from Nichols. Foster's drawn coverage from Adam Big Hill. And look at the advantage he's got. So Foster's running his route. Big Hill is watching White because there's no way he's going to let John White run all over him again. But now Foster's got a step. And Big Hill's fast. I really like him as a player. But he's a 4-6 guy chasing a 4-4 guy from behind. And Foster's got a wall of blockers. <laughs> I can't, look, see, look at Big Hill. I can't believe he's still here. What happened here? Oh, come on, Rogers. Okay, all right, check this out. So John White is awesome at this. We saw him do it last week a number of times. Foster, when he knows, like when he gets to the outside here, he's decided that he's going to bounce this outside. That's where this is going to end up. But it's the defensive back's job to turn him back inside where the linebackers are. So Foster has to take this hard inside step. And now Miller can't help himself. He gives up his outside position which helps Curly Gittins Jr. hold that block just long enough to get Foster on the outside. But that's, that's all set up by Foster. That's Foster's work with that hard jab step, knowing the whole time that he was going to end up going to the outside. This is an awesome play. I could spend an hour on this one, but let's look at the nuts and bolts here. So watch this through because I'm going to need to stop this a billion times when we break this down. And I want you to remember what the overall play looks like. At the 10-yard line, you're almost always going to get man coverage. And that's a key element in design and in calling this play. So as they line up, we've got White on Arbuckle's left. So red alert, White's near the end zone. They're not letting him in this week. They're determined on that. Shotgun with a back on the left pre-snap. The Bombers are usually going to be looking for an inside zone coming this way. It's man, so when Rodgers crosses over to the field side, he takes Nichols with him. So one of their best tackling DBs is now out of the play. Devaris Skinny's in, and now White jogs out wide. So what does that do? Alfred now has to play in the slot where he's far less comfortable. He likes being on the outside, and they've turned Briggs into a corner, which obviously he's not comfortable with. Plus, he's one-on-one -on -one with White, so he's not thinking about anyone else on this play but White. He's out of the play. And while all this was going on, Foster quietly sneaks into the backfield. So Nichols calls for a switch, which Winnipeg showed they would do last week. So it's a running play, and where are the run stoppers? Where are the backers? One's out here playing corner, and the other's in the slot. Big Hill, the only real backer left, has a twist, which is, that's just good luck for the Argos, because they can leave him, and they, they do. Foster initiates this quick little counter step that's going to freeze Nichols for a second. Everyone's going to down block here and Campbell pulls to kick out Jefferson. This, this is what we call a gentleman's block from Campbell. Showing some respect, but still effective. He could have just cleaned them out here. Allen and Castro have a double team, but they've got... so. They've got to seal their guy to the inside. That's a big part of this, this block, and you should be able to do that with a double team. Nicastro climbs, which is the correct decision here, but then Allen loses him to the outside. Fortunately, he's out of Foster's reach. He's able to kind of sidestep it. And now is DJ Foster time. So we got a hard cut. What happened here? Devaris. All right, look at this step. This is crazy athleticism. All right, I love this view. Here we go. Counter step, down block, kick out, hard cut, X, triangle, L2. Foster is a video game. So this is the exact same look. This is just flipped. 
White's in the backfield. He bounces out. Brissett skinnies in. But here comes White now galloping back in and all eyes shift to him. So watch these frames. We'll go slow here. Everybody's moving this way. Nobody's moving to the boundary and that's where the play is heading. That's where Foster's going. Great blocking. And then Foster gets low, powers out the last few yards himself. Like all the best backs, he's got this gift for falling forward. All right, let's give the line some love. Tight left. We got six in the box. They're going to add two more when Rodgers and Brissett sort of swoop around in here. This play shouldn't work. They don't have the numbers and Big Hill is blitzing into the hole that they're running into. But there are four men on this play who do <laughs> incredible things. So you got Campbell, Bladek, Cross, and of course Foster. Let's start with Campbell. So Campbell's got, he's got Big Hill. When Big Hill blitzes, when he commits to blitz, that's going to turn into Campbell's guy now. And he's going to have to do what we call a scoop block. This is when the guy he needs to block is on the inside and he needs to block him to the outside. This is one of the most difficult blocks in football. So pre-snap, he has inside position. Campbell needs to get on the other side of him and force him out. This is hard enough with a lumbering three tech, but he's got to do this with Big Hill. And here he is. One second into the play, Campbell's locked up and Big Hill's on the outside. Awesome. Let's look at Bladek. So he's got all 300 pounds of Ricky Walker. And Walker gets a really nice jump off the snap of the ball. He stands up Bladek in the hole. But Bladek answers back. He throws Walker to the left and he's got one Two, three guys caught in the wash. This is just, this is an awesome block. Let's watch this one again. Look at the force from Bladek. And he just takes these three guys out of the play by walking Ricky Walker back there. That's, that's awesome. All right, let's shift to Declan Cross. So he's lined up as a tight end. He's got Alfred, but this is a really tough block. If he charges right at Alfred, he's just going to step around him. This is a really easy block to evade for a DB when you see him coming. And in this open field, you're going to see him coming. So this is sort of a classic receiver stock block that he's got going on here. He's waiting for Alfred to plant. There it is. And then Cross explodes to the inside and boxes him out. And that gives Foster this wide open runway. And finally, let's focus on the man of the hour, DJ Foster. So he's in pistol. He knows there's trouble pre-snap. This is supposed to be a quick hitter, but he's got to chop his feet while he waits for Campbell and Bladek to open the door. And things are closing in. Rogers has got to cut down Jeffcoat, but he's close enough that Jeffcoat can still try to arm tackle Foster. So Foster sort of evades that. I wish we had a better angle of that happening here. And here we are. The door is open but there are no more blockers left. And Nichols is exploding into the hole. It's sort of a mystery as to how Foster escapes here. He, he gets real skinny and then he powers through Nichols like he's not even there and then turns on the Jets. He sees Nick Taylor closing, but I love that he's checking his mirrors. He sees Alfred closing in and then protects the ball. He did a great job of that all day. Anytime there was traffic, he covered up. He was going to make sure that he didn't fumble today. This is some great football on this play. This is, it, it's just it's Foster running into the breach. And then here's Bladek emerging with Walker on skates. Campbell with inside position on Big Hill. And Cross with the seal. That is awesome. Foster's going to command a lot more attention when the Argos play next. But that's only going to open things up for John White and provide opportunities for, for misdirection, for play action, for all sorts of creativity from Coach Dinwiddie and Coach Jackson. Defenses are basically going to have to pick their poison. And with the offensive line blocking the way they are, this offensive unit is going to have the rest of the league at their mercy. Well, that would just about do it for us today. I hope you enjoyed our week three film session on DJ Foster. This is Ben Grant saying so long and may all your pre-snap reads be good ones. I'll see you.